Yes, so some, some people will have to share. Um, I just thought I'd take you through uh, a bit one of the end projects of this, one of the end results of this project should be a, a shared book. And uh, this is sort of the very first draft of my, my contribution to that, so I'm interested in hearing what you make of it. And what I'm going to be arguing for ultimately is that linguistic issues aside, um, and those can be interesting, but I'm not sure they're the things that are most important. Transhumans and posthumans are one of us. If we want to say that they're then human, so be it. If we want to say they're rational animals, which is the line I'm going down, so be it. If we want to say they're persons, we can go down that line. But in some important sense, they're united to us and have the same sort of rights and responsibilities and so on and so forth that we do. And the reason I uh, have taken this approach is, is when we met last January, we were talking about the different sorts of modifications. My sort of gut reaction to a lot of them was like, eh, I've beaten it. I have no objection to that. I was discussing with my wife the other day, would you like a monkey tail or a peacock tail? I think we both decided a monkey tail to be more useful, because sometimes you need an extra set of hands. Um, and so if a scientist came along and said, do you want a monkey tail? Oh, I don't have a major issue with that. And then when the more extreme, people start talking about the more extremes of post-human stuff, often my instinctive response is either one of sort of disgust, which is sort of an aesthetic sort of emotion, or it's a uh, sort of ethical concern about power and this, that, and the other. Um, or just a concern about the lived experience of those people. But at no stage did I ever have the intuition from things that we were talking about that transhumans and posthumans weren't one of us. And that sort of stopped that <coughs> one line of worry, one line of concern that we might have. So potentially I'm, I'm disagreeing with my previous speaker, so, um, in that respect. Um, and I wonder whether maybe my reasons for having that intuition are because I've been you know, born in the 90s, early 90s, um, and so I've been raised with the idea of lots of science fiction, lots of futuristic talk of what will happen in the future. So maybe I'm just very comfortable with it. You know, I've, I've raised on ET and things like that. I have a strong feeling that ET is a person, and we ought not to experiment on him. And the Americans are bad for doing that, and so on and so forth. So maybe that's why I have these intuitions. Um, but that was the interest I had. And then in the context of doing my PhD a couple of years ago, I'd come across a paper by one of my supervisors, which I've referenced briefly, although I've taken a different tactic, where he argues that transhumans, posthumans, humans, he calls them superhumans, would be human. And he, uh, which I'll touch on briefly, he thinks the word human, person, rational animal should all be used interchangeably. I don't want to weigh in on that particular debate. So that, does that kind of set the scene for you? So I'm going to go through this, and what I'm going to do is I'm first of all going to look at uh, what is humanity, and I'm going to look at that by first of all comparing humans to animals and trying to find a relevant distinction. Along the way, I'm going to compare animals to plants. Then when I've worked out the between animals and plants, I'll go up to animals, up to people, and then up to trans humans, post humans. And then there'll be some sort of general musings at the end about what I think the relevant questions are. Everybody happy? And do feel free to jump in if, if anybody's got any questions. We've got my phone out. So keep an eye on the time. I've got 45 minutes until 1 o'clock. Yeah, we can do it before the one. 1.45. 1.45, okay. You might think you might. Sorry, the first one is rather self-driving. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, as Nick Bostrom explains, transhumanism, transhumanism is a loosely defined movement that has developed gradually over the past two decades, and he was writing about ten years ago. It promotes an interdisciplinary approach to understanding and evaluating the opportunities for enhancing the human condition and the human organism opened up by the advancement of technology. Attention is given to both present technologies like genetic engineering and information technology, and anticipated future ones such as molecular nanotechnology and artificial intelligence. And so, end quote. And very roughly, <coughs> at least the way I'm use the terms, a transhuman is a person that looks recognizably human, but who has been modified through technology. So, think of cyborgs and other sort of similar creatures, robotic arm, my, me with my monkey tail, 
that by the transhuman, according to this account. And a post-human is a person who's been modified by or united with technology in a way which prevents them from being recognised as a human. And that uh, distinction was originally put by Matthew James in January. And I tried to find a, a nice article that explained it so succinctly, but I couldn't. So I've just given a quick note of credit to him. To him. So increasing numbers of scientists and philosophers think that transhumans and posthumans, and from now on I'm just going to talk about transhumans, will one day become a reality and potentially in the near future. Arguably, we, as long as you've had eyeglasses, we've already started to see. My uncle recently had a new business. Potentially, he's a cyborg now. So this possibility raises a number of ethical and philosophical issues, not least of which is their relationship to us unmodified humans. Indeed, it seems to me that this question is of first importance because we cannot answer any of the subsequent questions their reality might raise, for example, legal and political questions, before we've answered this question. We need to know whether they are one of us. And in this paper, I'll try to shed some light on this question. Perhaps strangely, I'll begin by examining the difference between animals and humans. I will do this in order to sharpen up our understanding of human nature. Having done this, I will then be in a position to examine whether transhumans are one of us. And to answer this question in the affirmative, I then consider some of the most, most pressing ethical concerns that emerge out of this realization. So, in the Psalter, the Psalms, the Psalmist asks of God, What is man that thou art mindful of him? And religious and interpretive issues aside, and I'm aware I'm speaking in a Catholic university with a lot of theologians, so I'm sure there's translation issues and lots of different ways of interpreting that. But on the face of it, that strikes me as a good question. What is it that distinguishes us as a species from other organisms that we're familiar with? And a common answer refers to our linguistic abilities, which we've seen crop up time and time again in the previous talks. Language is clearly very important. Aristotle, for example, in the politics, highlights that man alone of the animals possesses speech. The mere voice, it is true, can indicate pain and pleasure, and therefore is possessed by the other animals as well. <coughs> For their nature has been developed so far as to have sensations of what is painful and pleasant, and to indicate those sensations to one another. But speech is designed to indicate the advantageous and the harmful, and therefore also the right and the wrong, for it is the special property of man in distinction from the other animals that he alone has perception of good and bad, and right and wrong, and the other moral qualities. And it's partnership in these things that makes a household and a city state. This might suggest that what makes us human, end quote, this might suggest that what makes us human is the ability to use language. In and of itself, however, this is too simple. If anybody's ever studied any philosophy of language, the definition of language and what's needed for a communication system to count as language is extremely difficult to determine and is highly philosophically contentious. However, modern science has shown that a variety of animals have surprisingly sophisticated communication systems. And to give a handful of examples, I'm sure people could add more to this, but to give a handful, a number of species of birds have been found to use compositional syntax in their communication systems. That's a fancy way of saying they, they have a series of words and they can combine those words in different ways to make different sentences. Composed compositional syntax. And syntax is the, 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 you and I, and unless you're a linguist, in grammar, basically. There are rules for how you do it. You put the words in a certain order, they're meaningful, the birds respond in a certain way, you put them in another order, and they just look confused. They, they tested that by recording them, putting them in different orders, and playing them back. Russell and Town, then 2017. Trained apes, we're probably all familiar with this, are able to master vocabularies of several hundred words comparable to human toddlers. Whether they can combine them into sentences is a bit more debatable. There's probably a lot of their human trainers reading into what they're doing. They're probably, my suspicion is they're just spouting out words and we then interpret them as sentences. Either way, impressive vocabularies. And many animals also display context sensitivity and dependence when communicating. And I'm going to return to that in a bit. So it seems to me that these findings risk turning the distinction between human beings and animals into one of degree rather than one of kind. But rather than there being humans which exist in this category and then animals go over there, we'd have all animals on a sort of spectrum and then we just so happen to be at the top. 
there might be a big gap between us and the next nearest creature. That gap might be quite small. You'd have to ask an ethologist or a biologist about that. Again, I would, you know, if we take the full naturalistic evolutionary story, you know, I would have to, what reason would we have for thinking there's a big gap? So, which would, to me makes it even more worrying to be a, you know, we just so happen to be slightly better than the next creature. So we could embrace this, and this is the conclusion Darwin came to based on his theory of evolution, and many subsequent thinkers have followed him in this. However, uh, many of us, myself included, are left feeling uncomfortable by this. Animals often do surprises with their intelligence, sophistication, and beauty. However, no animal has ever written even a single word, let alone something of Shakespearean or Dickensian quality. Further, when we compare, compare animal tools to the rockets that put men on the moon, there seems to be no comparison. So perhaps we should be cautious about so quickly rejecting the possibility of a difference in kind between humans and animals. On top of this, I'd add, uh, my current and our current ethical practices. If it really is just a difference of degree of kind, am I really comfortable eating meat? Things like that. If it just so happens I'm a little bit more intelligent than them. I wouldn't feel more comfortable eating a man with a low IQ than a higher IQ. And that's a difference of degree, and if it's just a slightly bigger difference of degree, why does that matter? Maybe I should become a vegetarian. So perhaps we should Anyway, so it seems to me we should be cautious about so quickly rejecting the possibility of difference in kind between humans and animals. And I'm not saying we should rule out the possibility that the difference between humans and animals is merely one of degree, absolutely, or with complete certainty. After all, we should remain open to all options, and reality can often surprise us. However, what I am saying is that this intuition, these observations, suggest we should only conclude that the difference is one of degree when all differences of kind have been ruled out. And hopefully I'm going to find the difference. That would be for you to judge. So perhaps the difference in kind can be found in language by acknowledging that animals can have surprisingly sophisticated communication systems, whilst insisting that there is at least one feature or handful of features that clearly demarcate human languages from animal communication systems. And Pietro Conti, who's a philosopher and linguist in Italy, he, well, I don't think he necessarily follows all the philosophical conclusions that I'm suggesting he thinks, though, that a difference in sort of kind can be found between human languages and animal communication systems. That's all he's saying. And then saying you could use this to argue there's a difference in kind between humans and animals. He thinks that this can be done by examining context dependence in human language compared to animal communication systems. He believes that although animals can display context dependence in their communication systems, there are two types of context dependence that are unique to humans and human language. And if Gant is right, then this might allow us to maintain that there's a difference in kind between human language and animal communication systems, and thus a difference in kind between humans and animals. And I'll now briefly summarize the context <coughs> and I'll then explain why I don't believe this to be a fruitful avenue. I'm going to explain all, all the terms. If I sort of leave anybody behind, feel free to put up your hand. It took me a while to get my head around these terms. I haven't done much philosophy of language, so this is really interesting for me, but I did have to go so if I go too fast, just let me know and I'll give you some examples. So Picanti begins by distinguishing between four types of context dependence. The first three he borrows from Perry, 1998. He then adds a fourth category of his own. He believes that the first two are, with certain caveats added, and that's what I'm going to get in, unique to humans. As a result, Conti thinks that though animal communication systems can display context dependence, Human languages display context events in a, new, in, a new, yeah, in a unique way, which he labels indexicality. So the first type of context dependence is labeled pre-semantic. So according to Perry, we use the context, the context of the conversation, in a pre-semantic way to establish which meaning a word is being used, or which of several words that look or sound like is being used, proving which language is being used. The example, end quote, the example given by Conti to illustrate this is the word bank in English. If we're walking along a river looking for a place to have a picnic, and I said, it's a good bank, you know I meant something very different than if we were walking through the centre of London past the Nat West. On the one hand, you know that I mean by the word 
You know what I mean by the word bank because of the context. In one context, I mean the side of a river, where it's appropriate to have a picnic. In the other, I mean a place or organization responsible for financial transactions. Everybody happy with that? So as Picante explains, these are called pre-semantic in that recourse to the context precedes recognition of the meaning of the expressions and indeed serves to identify the right meaning, end quote. Conti then highlights that we might object to this label because this act of using the context to determine the meaning of the word is itself a semantic move. As well, perhaps it's mislead, leading to label it pre-semantic given to the semantic move itself. However, for the purposes of Conti's paper, this distinction is unimportant and so he continues to use Perry's terminology, and I'll follow him in this for the same reason. Uh, I'm just heading off a quibble there. Gonti then examines whether any animal communication systems uses context in this way, and he concludes that if we rely on the knowledge available today, we find that pre-semantic uses of the context seem to have no counterpart in the languages of other animals. End quote. But he then adds it must be admitted but this assertion is not based on research specifically aiming to verify this possibility. And if anybody is familiar with this area, the content paper is a little bit out of date now, so if there's something more recent, then do let me know. That would be really helpful. As a result, it seems to me that basing any philosophical conclusions on this would be unwise. A philosophical theory which rests on highly contentious empirical premises seems to me to be obviously undesirable. Further, any conclusions based on it would have to be conditional and dependent upon future scientific findings. Due to this, I don't think Conti has yet made his case. Maybe I'm being a philosophical snob and purist, but I don't want to come up with a theory that could be falsified tomorrow. You only need to find one instance of it, and the whole theory would collapse if we base it just on this. Maybe the second form will be more successful. The second form of context dependence that Conti appeals to are what Perry calls semantic uses. These uses involve the use of demonstratives and indexicals, and don't be intimidated by the terms. For the sake of completeness, pure indexicals have their content or reference fixed purely through their meaning and use. Standard examples include today and I. I can utter these words and entirely because of their meaning and the time and place in which I've used them, you'll know to what I'm referring. So that's a pure indexical. Pure indexicals often contrast with true demonstratives. True demonstratives require something additional in order to fix their content or referent. So standard examples include that and this. If I simply said that without pointing to an object, or when it hasn't been made clear by the previous words in the conversation, it would be unclear to what I'm referring. So something additional is required. And then as a sort of footnote I've added, presumably the distinction between pure indexicals and true demonstratives allows for the possibility of impure or mixed indexicals and potential examples that occur to me are far away and nearby. A television remote can be far away but in a very different way to a distant country. I'm sitting on the sofa and my wife walks by and she's standing. The remote's far away. I mean something very different than when I'm talking about a country. At the same time, if the remote is literally in my lap, it's definitely nearby. I can't use the word far away. So it looks like both the context and the meaning are both relevant. The meaning kind of the meaning of nearby and far away shuts down some options, but the context still needs to narrow it down a bit more. So that, that might be something in the middle. What pure and the, don't worry too much about that distinction. What pure indexicals and true demonstrators have in common is that their reference changes from use to use. And, the con and context to context, and as a result, they're all included under the banner of indexicals. So this, that, I, you, he, she, it, tomorrow, today, those are indexicals. Everybody got that. What's interesting about indexicals is that they have something that has come to be called a character. And as Gant explains, character is the linguistic rule associated with the demonstrative the guide is <coughs> the right individual in the context. For example, the character of that is more or less, this is Picante's account, the relevant object that is distant from the speaker. End quote. Similarly, the character of I, this was my example, is more or less the speaker, unless they're directly quoting another individual, in which case it's that individual. Or something to the 
respect. So human languages clearly contain indexicals and there are rules for how we interpret them. So what about animal communication systems? Do they contain indexicals? Another thing to note is the simplest indexical is pointing. So they can point to different things. That's the simplest one. What about animal communication systems? Do they contain indexicals? As Piconti says, if we found an animal signal fixing its reference by means of a rule of application analogous to character, then it would be faced with something similar to expressions like today, this, and that. End quote. Piconti explores this question in considerable detail, and included a reference at the back of the paper if you want to read it. But he ultimately concludes that although some species of animals can be taught to use indexicals, this happens rarely. They can, they can be taught, but only under very unusual circumstances, and it's not part of the natural behaviour of any species other than humans. And that explains why he labels humans' context dependence indexicality. Once again, however, I have some concerns. First, as with my concern about pre semantic uses, future empirical research may falsify Piconti's claim, though there has been more research done on this. And this strikes me as undesirable. Further, the fact that animals can be taught to use indexicals, and it's mostly apes who have been taught this, is Coco the gorilla is the main example you might have heard of. If animals can be taught to use indexicals, this strikes me as doubly worrying. If animals of certain species can be taught to use indexicals, then it's clearly an inbuilt potentiality of that species to use indexicals. As a result, the fact that they don't currently naturally use indexicals strikes me as an accident, and I'm meaning this in the strict narrative sense and the everyday sense, strikes me as an accident rather than an essential feature of their nature. If a gorilla can be taught to use indexicals by human beings, then it doesn't seem a stretch to imagine that a gorilla could teach a gorilla to use indexicals. If a group of gorillas haven't been taught to use indexicals, then escape into the wild, for other wild gorillas to use indexicals, then you would have gorillas using indexicals in the wild. Thus, it might become part of their natural behavior, even if it currently isn't. Perhaps one would object that ultimately it was human beings who taught these gorillas to use indexicals, and so even this shouldn't count as part of their natural behavior. My concern here is that if they can be taught to use indexicals, then it only takes one through a genius to have a freak flash of insight to get the whole thing started entirely without human beings. And I don't see how anybody could deny that this would then count as part of their natural behavior. Indeed, presumably this is how our early human or pre-human ancestors invented the use of indexicals. So if it's natural for us, it would be natural for these people. I'm cautious here of overstepping my bounds as a philosopher, much of this is pure conjecture on my part, and there may be ethological and biological reasons to rule this out. However, I think that my basic concern still stands, and hopefully that's clear enough, but you might want to challenge me here. We still haven't categorically ruled out the possibility that some animal species do use indexicals naturally, however we understand the word natural. And even if this could be done, and on practical grounds it seems unlikely, because you'd have to go and test every single animal species, there's a lot of them, even if this could be done, we still have incidents of animals being taught to use them. And so this suggests to me that once again we found a difference of degree, not of kind. So I don't think this is going to be a good avenue to go down. For the sake of completeness, I'll briefly explain the other two types of context dependence we want to explore. The third is post-semantic uses. The quantity explains that post-semantic uses of the context occur when after the words have been identified, their standard meaning has been recognized and the situation of occurrence has been assured to something else is still required in order to identify <coughs> proposition expressed by a certain utterance. And a standard example would involve someone uttering something like, it's raining. In order to fully understand what they meant, whether it's true, or what implications this has, one would need to identify at the very least the unarticulated time and place, perhaps other additional factors. Right now, I could say it's raining, and there's some sense in which that's true, because somewhere in the world it probably is. But what I obviously mean is I mean it's not really here, so that will come up as false. So you're using the context after I've used it. And the Conti suggests that there are animal analogues of this type of context dependent. I wasn't terribly persuaded by him here. The basic concern to animals saying food, and then he assumed that all the other animals understood that meant here and now. Maybe. That seems very simple to me. 
The final type of complex dependency is which the context explores what he labels extra semantic uses, and he writes by extra semantic uses, I mean variations in meaning depending on social and so, social and social factors. Right, spelling error. Depending on social and something else factors. As an example, in 21st century Britain, I don't know about in the States, for someone under the age of 20, under the age of 20, at least when I was under 20, it was a little while right now. The word sick can be a term of approval, roughly synonymous with cool. However, for someone over the age of 40, let's say, the word sick is a term of disapproval, roughly synonymous with perverse. And so when somebody says sick, at least somebody of, of my age looks at how old they are and then tries to work out what they mean by it. That's extra simple. And the, the example he gives is animal, uh, is, uh, with infants. Um, so animal babies will often make alarm calls because they're learning how to do it. And the adults know not to worry, it's just the infant testing it out. So they look they, at the, the context. And due to these sorts of considerations, it seems to me that we're unlikely to find a clear difference in kind between humans and animals purely by comparing animal communication systems to human language. At the same time, language is clearly an important part of what makes us human. After all, we talk about human languages compared to animal communication systems. And this suggests that when we look for what makes us unique amongst animals, although we're not looking at language directly, we're looking for something intimately tied to language. So now this is the avenue that I do think is fruitful. So as Matthew Boyle points out, according to a tradition reaching back at least as far as Aristotle, human beings are set apart from other terrestrial creatures by their rationality, end quote. Put another way, human beings are rational animals. However, as Bertrand Russell has pointed out, in a sort of slightly glib way, man is a rational animal, so at least I have been told. Throughout a long life, I have looked diligently for evidence in favour of this statement, but so far I have not had the good fortune to come across it. End quote. So Russell was not unique in his scepticism about the idea of man as a rational animal within modern psychology, there's a growing body of research to suggest that particularly under certain circumstances, humans are prone to logical areas of reasoning, subconscious biases, and so on. And that, how are we getting off time? I'll, I'll, I'll skip it out. I give some examples. So this sort of evidence, so somebody could claim, shows that we're not really <coughs> rational animals. If humans don't make practical decisions or form their beliefs in a rational way, all or even most of the time, what sense can we make of the claim that human beings are rational animals? So as Boyle points out, rather than seeing rationality as one human property or ability amongst many, we need to understand that rationality transforms all of our principal mental powers, making our minds different in kind from the minds of non-rational animals." End quote. And how this is possible is best <laughs> illustrated, perhaps surprisingly, by looking at the difference between animals and plants. And I'm going to take it as a given, but that's something we could discuss, that there's a difference in kind between plants and animals. However, as we'll see, this difference in kind cannot be identified with any single property or handful of properties. Rather, the difference between plants and animals is based on a funda different fundamental way of being in the world, which modifies all of their principal properties and abilities. And this is best illustrated by examining some concrete examples. So, let's suppose we put behind you now, we're trying to find a single property that separates all animals from all plants, and we can see that this approach isn't going to work. So one of the most obvious, apparent differences a patient might start between plants and animals if we're trying to identify a single distinguishing feature that separates them is that animals can move in a way that plants can't. After all, dogs and cats can walk and run, but trees are literally rooted into the ground. This might make us conclude that the difference is one of locomotion. However, this is too quick. Excuse the pun. <coughs> there are a number of sessile animals which are incapable of movement. And you barnacles, clouds, that's it. Further, plants can move, most obviously, towards the sun. Sunflowers are particularly good examples of this. I, did, I had heard that there was a walking plant, a walking tree. And I did loads of research because that would be a perfect example. Turns out it, its powers have been slightly exaggerated. <laughs> so I was quite irritated to discover that. But some flowers will suffice. Another feature we might point to would be the fact that animals eat, 
for his plans for a synthesize. We're all familiar with the infamous Venus flytrap, which captures and, in inverted commas, eats its insect prey. Other examples could be given, but these two will suffice. The point is that isolating a single capacity or even bundle of capacities and simplistically using that as the cutoff point between plants and animals will not suffice. There may well often be borderline cases which refuse to fit neatly into either category if we use this method. I'm not saying it would never work, I'm just saying I don't think it's a good way to go about it. Maybe there is a single problem. I mean, if biologists do pick certain properties about cell walls, and animal, plant, animal cells don't have cell walls, but plants do. What's the relevance of that? We can imagine a tree person who's half tree, half animal. You can be a plant for an animal. And we can also think of examples, again, walking, think about triplets. Triplets, they don't exist. If they did exist, they'd be plants, but they can walk. So a difference in kind can be identified between plants and animals by looking at how they engage in their multifarious activities. As Boyle explains, consider what it means to talk about activity in the case of a plant and in the case of an animal. Many people will be tempted to say that plants do not act at all, and there is, of course, a sense in which that is right. They do not act in the sense in which animals act. Nevertheless, there are clearly some episodes in the lives of plants in which they figure as agents rather than mere patients. Nevertheless, when we speak of the goal-directed acts of an animal, we are clearly speaking of agency and goal-directedness in an altogether different register. It's not merely that an animal can do more than a plant. It's the talk of doing can apply in a whole new way to an animal. End quote. So Boyle then illustrates this difference in more detail by highlighting that, unlike animals, descriptions of the here and now can never enter into the characterization of the acts of plants except in the form of triggerings, triggerings helps, or hindrances. He gives the example of a tree growing around a stone compared to an animal walking around a stone. The root of a tree can be growing around a stone, but it would be a less sentimental to suggest that the root is growing in a certain way in order to get round this stone. The presence of this stone here and now does not inform the content of the tree's act of root growth, that towards which it is goal directly tending. The tree's roots simply grow, as far as possible, according to a certain pattern. The stone enters as a hindrance to this growth, something that interferes and hence qualifies the sense in which the shape of the resultant growth can be understood as the tree's own doing, rather than as a reflection of something done to it. End quote. Animals, however, can actively respond to the here and now, and thus the description of the present circumstances can enter into the content of what they're doing. The Boyle highlights its capacities for perception and desire transform its mode of being alive precisely because they make this possible. They open animal life not merely to the causal influence of present circumstances in the form of triggering hindrance or facilitation, but to the kind of influence that enters into the constitution of what the subject is doing. Thus, an animal can try to get that object or do something in order to avoid this obstacle. End quote. So another way of approaching this distinction gets to the same place with different final attack is to point out that animals can act as individuals in a way that plants do not. A particular oak tree can grow a particular branch, but the explanation for why this is happening has little to do with that individual. Growing branches is simply what oak trees do. The individual oak tree itself has not determined what should happen. On the other hand, when we try to understand why an animal is doing what it's doing, and depending upon the act in question, we do have to look at the experiences, history, and dispositions of this particular individual. My wife and I recently got some kittens, and they definitely have different personalities. To put this far too crudely, in some sense of the word, animals can be said to, again, I'm put some quotation marks, choose certain things, although in a very different way to humans, which we'll come on to. Whereas plants cannot choose anything in any sense of the word. That's just my sort of intuitive way of getting you in the right headspace. I'm not saying that's an accurate way of looking for that. Far too crude. Maybe it gets you in the right headspace. As Boyle points out, it's not merely that animals can do things that plants cannot, it's that the whole language of doing takes on a new significance, a new logical character when we turn from plants to animals. So we're now in a position <coughs> to examine the difference between animals and humans 
distinction between humans and animals is not simply that we're capable of doing, being, and having things that they cannot do, be, and have. Rather, the distinction that human beings are capable of being the subject of descriptions of doing, being, and having in a distinctive sense. Both humans and animals and plants can act in a goal-directed manner and as a response to their environments and circumstances. However, only human beings, in the full sense of the word, are capable of acting intentionally. As Boyle explains, it's widely conceded that a condition of the applicability of descriptions of doing in this distinctive sense, intentional doing, is that the creature should be doing what it's doing knowingly, in virtue of exercising its powers to determine what ends are worth doing and how to pursue them. The power to act in this distinctive sense, to engage in doing to description, implies that the subject knows what he is doing and what for, is the special prerogative of rational creatures. End quote. Rational animals uniquely are capable of acting towards a specific goal whilst knowing it and understanding it as a goal. Non-rational animals are capable of acting towards a specific goal but will not know it and understand it as a goal. And you were giving some examples of a similar sort of idea. There we were in agreement. As Boyle explains using the language of Aquinas, thus Aquinas holds that although non-rational animals can be said to intend and act and act voluntarily in pursuit of it in an imperfect sense, they're not capable of intentional voluntary action in the perfect sense, since they do not ordain their movements to an end in virtue of knowledge of that end under the aspect of an end. Rather, they merely apprehend an object they desire and act from instinct required habit in pursuit of it. As a result, again, a rough and highly flawed sort of litmus test here, your head seems to the right sort of place, litmus test for rationality that perhaps intuitively but imperfectly brings out the relevant distinction is that in order for something to be rational, we need to be able to ask and it needs to be able to answer, at least in principle, the question, why are you doing this? I remember writing that when I was reading this paper. That's get you in the right headspace. I can, you know, I, sometimes I rhetorically ask one of our kittens, why are you doing this, as she jumps up onto the worktop yet again, but I know I'm never going to get an answer. It's the wrong sort of question to ask that sort of creature. However, even this is too much, this obviously presupposes that the rational creature speaks a language and is capable of communicating with us, and this may not be possible. So I'm sort of hedging my bets. There may be creatures out there that are rational, but they can't speak, or at least not speak to us. That's so different. Mm -hmm. So as a result, even this litmus test is inadequate, although perhaps it illustrates the basic insight. From their perspective, that's kind of the difference. So a few clarifications now needed. First, there isn't enough space here to come to any conclusions about whether the definition of humanity is rational animality, nor is there space to weigh in on questions such as whether rational animality is exhaustive of humanity's essence, or whether terms like person, human, homo sapiens, and rational animal are interchangeable terms. I opened up that can of worms, it's a big can of worms, and I think it's an interesting debate, but it's, I don't think it has any relevance for our sort of project or for this paper. It may be that the terms human being, person, and rational animal are interchangeable, and that the definition of humanity is rational animality, which is exhaustive of our essence, and that's the approach that David Oberberg takes. It may be that homo sapiens or human beings are merely a type of rational animal. That's the approach that Boyle takes in his paper. For our purposes, it doesn't matter. What matters is that a crucial part of what makes you, me, and every other human being on this planet, what and who we are, is that we're rational and that we're animals in the senses explained earlier. And this unites us and is something important we all share. Further, if there are any other rational creatures out there, whether they be terrestrial or extraterrestrial, whether they have fur, feathers or scales, two legs, four legs, six legs, eight legs or no legs and so on, they will all be united to us and the same as us in an important and crucial sense. They'll be one of us. So if anybody's familiar with Locke's rational power, that would be one of us. Whether it's a man, I'm, I'm not sure that matters so much, and uh, Swiss, who him in news, who delivers travels, they're the talking uh, horses, they're intelligent, they, they would be united to us in an important sense. <coughs> yeah. Second, this account in no way a priori, another clarification, in no way a priori rules out the possibility of other terrestrial rational animals. Some thinkers might claim that certain species, such as cetaceans and higher apes, fulfill these criteria. I won't weigh in on that question here, since this is a question for the biologists and ethologists to answer. However, it does follow from this account that if there are other rational animals, then there is a fundamental break in kind between them and the non-rational animals, 
whichever those turn out to be. Either, we have, either way, we have escaped the uncomfortable conclusion that the difference between human beings and uncontroversial non-rational animals is merely one of degree rather than one of kind. If we have to expand the rational animal club to include other species in the future, then so be it. So two things follow from this in the here and now. First, it may well mean that some of our taxonomic practices need to be re-evaluated. Second, it means that when trying to determine whether or not a particular individual is a rational animal, we can no longer appeal to one simple test, property or capacity. Instead, we will need to examine the individual as a whole. We need to examine not only its properties, capacities and abilities, but how it engages in and actualizes those properties, capacities and abilities. So from an epistemic perspective, in the real world, there may well be individuals whose rationality cannot be uncontentiously and definitively ascertained. There may well be a, a species out there that can't really communicate with us very well because they're just wired so differently. It may be very difficult for us to ever work out whether they are rational. In terms of the measurements we can practically make, the difference between a highly sophisticated non-rational animal and a dull-witted rational animal might be slight. However, from a metaphysical perspective, every individual will either be rational or non-rational in the sense explained earlier. And this makes all the difference from the inside. Their way of being in the world and their very essence will be very different, and this is important ethical implications. At the end of the previous sections, I concluded that one of the des desiderata when identifying what distinguishes humans from animals was that it should be intimately linked, not identical to language. Does rationality, as understood here, fill this condition? I think it does. Rational thought, and thus rationality itself, seems to be intimately, intimately tied to language. I struggle to imagine what it would be like to think without language of any sort, at least. We not words, but images. <coughs> this might lead us to agree with Dummett's view that language is the vehicle of thought. Further, as Oderberg has argued, abstract thought seems to require a representational system with a meaningful structure, and what is this if not language? The precise relationship between rationality, rational thought, and language goes beyond the limits of this paper, but it seems highly plausible to believe that they are intimately linked in some manner. So now to transhumans and posthumans. We're now in a position to examine whether transhumans and posthumans. The important question to answer is whether or not they will be rational animals in the senses, in the sense explained earlier. And it seems to me that they will. They will still have bodies, be they of flesh and blood, metal and silicon, or even electrons in a computer system. Maybe that's something that we might discuss some more. And they will need to sustain those bodies through the intake of energy or sources of energy, they need to eat in some sense of the word, the expelling of waste and through repair when they sustain damage. As a result, they'll be animals even if they are highly unusual animals. And I realise that I need to add something to that footnote there. They'll also be rational. Even if they develop cognitive or physical abilities which vastly outstrip normal human cognitive or physical abilities, they will still act towards specific goals whilst knowing, understanding and choosing them as goals. Even if they can do more things than us, like fly or breathe on the water, and even if they possess properties and abilities which we lack, they will do those things, have those properties, and exercise those abilities in a human way. As a result, they will be rational and animals and will be united to us in the same as us in an important and significant sense. It's worth noting that it follows from this, if we create transhumans, then we will have the same obligations to them as we do for any other human whom we have created. Currently, the quintessential relationship with collection of obligations takes the form of parenthood, though other forms may exist. It doesn't follow from this that we will necessarily have parental obligations towards transhumans. After all, they may be created fully mature and educated, able to look back to themselves. And if this is were the case, then maybe they wouldn't need parents. I might challenge that. If I get older, I still need my parents. Even though I'm now married, I still need them. But so, anyway, you get the idea. However, it does mean that if we create transhumans who need parents, then the creators will either need to fill that role themselves or find someone who will. That obviously needs to be developed more. And obviously the most famous story of someone creating a transhuman failing to care for it appropriately is of course Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. So whilst these conclusions have closed down certain questions, other questions remain unanswered. It seems to me the most pressing question is what impact might these transhumans have on our society and what ethical implications will this have for their development? Here yeah, I can only briefly speculate, but it seems to me that the most worrying, plausible impact such individuals might have on our society 
is to exacerbate existing and create entirely new inequalities. I've got about two or three minutes left. Okay, two or three minutes. Currently, and as Thomas pointed out many years ago, nature hath made men so equal in the faculties of body and mind that though there be found one man sometimes manifestly stronger in body or of quicker mind than another, yet when all is reckoned together, the difference between man and man is not so considerable as that one man can thereupon claim to himself any benefit to which another man may not pretend as well as he. For as to the strength of the body, the weakest is strength enough to kill the strongest either by secret machination or by confederacy of others that are in the same danger with himself." Quote. This strikes me as an important observation. Even the world's strongest man can be overpowered by a handful of adults working together or through the use of a weapon. The world's greatest martial artist can be poisoned or killed when sleeping by a physically weak, elderly, untrained woman. The world's fastest man can still be outrun by a man on horseback. The world's most intelligent person will still make errors in judgment. Further, they can only become an expert on so many topics, which means they can be outwitted or fooled when engaging with an expert on something of which they have no experience of on or education. <coughs> on top of this, all of us will one day die. This limits the amount of damage that any humans can do to others. Transhumanism, if completely unchecked, threatens to undermine this delicate balance. If a person supplemented their physical capabilities to such an extent that they cannot be overpowered by conventional civil authorities, Kind of absurd that they might put their brain in a tank. I mean, some people might do that. Then the maintenance of genuine law and order would have would become unfeasible and vastly expensive. You might have to deploy the military every time a cyborg tried to rob a bank. Additionally, potentially someone could augment their intellectual powers to such a degree that they were able to manipulate political and economic systems to their massive advantage as a debit to save the <coughs> society at large. Potentially, we're already seeing that in certain contexts. To some extent, these last two concerns are simply the dangers of increased technology generally, but the possibility of vastly extending human life expectancy also brings particular risks. Very few people live to be more than 100 years old. When you remove the first 20 years when they're developing and being educated, and the last 20 when human mental and physical faculties tend to decline, no human being has more than about 60 effective years. This limits the benefits they can bring to society. So imagine if Einstein was still alive today, he'd have no doubt contributed a lot more <coughs> to our scientific understanding. However, it also, last page, however, it also limits the damages they can do to society. Imagine if the great dictators of the 20th century were still politically active today. Our limited lifespan also limits the amount of suffering that we must endure, death and suffering, at least for the person who is dead. So these concerns about increased equality, inequalities in power and life experience also go the other way, in the same way that trans humans might be more powerful than us, we might be more powerful than some trans humans. So two possibilities occur to me. First, one can imagine individuals genetically modifying embryos in order to remove undesirable traits like aggression, or to exaggerate desirable qualities such as cuteness, and you need only compare a chihuahua to a wolf to see why this might put certain trans humans at a disadvantage compared to unmodified humans. It's kind of an absurd example, but I suspect this thing will be a slippery slope. Second, with the rise of computers and artificial reality technology, certain sorts of transhumans could end up in a very vulnerable position if the conscious experiences of a group of transhumans, entirely computer-based, unmodified humans might be able to reprogram or manipulate the computers in which the transhumans live. And it would be an understanding, so this would put them at a disadvantage. So how we should respond to these possibilities goes beyond the scope of this paper, but I'll raise some questions. If modifying humans through technology puts them to advantage compared to their unmodified peers, then one way to avoid the results of inequality would be to modify everyone. However, it seems obvious that some will not wish to be modified. How do we protect them and their rights? Another way would be to prevent everybody from modifying. Nobody <coughs> can do it. But there are genuine and legitimate reasons why people might want to, a blind person wanting to restore sight. How do we weigh up the risks and benefits of these technologies? What are the legitimate and illegitimate uses? There are also questions about who controls these technologies. Do we leave to private corporations or to the state? Disadvantages with both. But it seems to me that these are the questions we should be asking. Thank you very much.